districts that receive over $1 million in financial assistance from the city of New York. Intro 2252 would also expand mandatory LPAs to include human service providers contracting with the city of New York. Any human service provider that has a contract or seeks to contract with the city of New York would require to submit certification ensuring that the city, ensuring the city services contract is awarded or renewed that the provider will comply with the LPA. The comptroller would be responsible for monitoring, investigating, and auditing compliance by all contracting parties with the law. The comptroller would also be responsible for taking actions against any violating party, which can, which can include terminating the city's contract of such party. We look forward to hearing from the administration as well as from labor unions, city developers, and service providers about their concerns uh, about this legislation specifically. If there are any significant concerns about the bill, we want to hear them now. If there are any unintended, consequence, unintended consequences we need to uh, be concerned about, we would like to discuss it this morning. If there is a better language that should be used to really get to the heart of the matter, we would like to hear that as well. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank my staff for putting this together, Chief Staff Ali Basunajad, John Marnie, and the great Joe Goldblum, as well as uh, Council Committee staff, Nusat, Thomas, and, and John. We've been joined by Council Members Adam, Moya, Rosenthal, <coughs> Ulrich, And uh, with that, uh, we will now hear a statement from the New York City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson. Thank you, Chair Miller. Good morning. I want to thank you all for being here today. And again, uh, thank you to Chair Miller for holding this important hearing. If the COVID-19 uh, crisis and pandemic has taught us anything, it's that our city simply could not survive without our social service workers but too many of them are underpaid and too many of them are underappreciated. And too many of them are denied the basic right to organize, the right to fight for and win the pay and benefits that they deserve. And it is time for that to change. I am very proud to sponsor introduction 2252, which would ensure the city's contracted social service workers are guaranteed the right to form a union. It will give over 200,000 of our city's essential social service workers the right to organize without fear of retaliation or punishment or interference from their employers. These workers are under contract with the city to provide daycare, foster care, home care, and health and medical services. They provide New Yorkers with housing and shelter assistance and youth services. They work at our senior centers, train New Yorkers with new employment skills and provide life-saving legal services. Labor peace agreements are a critical tool for strengthening these workers' rights. The city's labor peace requirement already applies to developers of economic development projects receiving $1 million or more in city funding or financial assistance, but that doesn't go far enough. So in addition to extending labor peace to social service workers, this bill also expands the right to all other tenants and concessionaires on site at those big economic development projects citywide, from concession stand workers at Barclays Center to retail workers at Essex Crossing. No city dollars or tax breaks should ever be paid out to employers who are engaging in union busting. That's what this bill will do, it'll ensure that New Yorkers hard earned tax dollars are going towards high quality jobs that build worker power. I am very, very proud that we are hearing this legislation today. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanna take a moment for the public who's watching, that they should know that this committee, the Committee on Civil Service and Labor has been one of the busiest committees in the city council in the last many months since COVID-19 hit meeting time and time again to protect workers in New York City, but the work has been going on even before the pandemic hit that this committee has been tackling. 
Over the last three and a half years, during my time as speaker, we have passed an extraordinary number of bills. And I believe the first bill that may have been passed in the city council in 2014, when you became chair, was expanding paid sick leave in New York City. So I want to really thank you. I want to thank you for your leadership, for your steadfast commitment to workers in New York City, whether they be undocumented workers or union workers or non-union workers. The city council is really proud of the work that we do day in and day out, month in and month out, year after year to protect workers. You are a former organizer, you are a former union president, and you are someone who understands the importance of empowering workers and the importance of collective bargaining and organizing. That's what this bill seeks to accomplish so that people can organize freely without interference. And I'm really grateful for your tenacity, steadfast leadership, not just throughout the pandemic, but over the last seven and a half years as a council member and chair of this committee. I know we have a bunch of unions that are gonna be testifying today. I see that we're joined by the executive director of District Council 37, Mr. Henry Garrido, my good friend and a friend to working women and men across New York City. I look forward to hearing his testimony and I look forward to hearing the testimony from the de Blasio administration. I, I hope they're gonna testify that they're supportive of this bill. And I wanna thank you, Mr. Chair, for giving me the time to speak this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we, we appreciate you. We appreciate your support and leadership uh, on behalf of working families, working people throughout the city of New York. And we, we have been pretty groundbreaking and set the template for how we treat workers throughout uh, the country. Uh, in this council here. Uh, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Chair Miller. Uh, I'm Thomas Nath, Policy Analyst for the Committee on Civil Service and Labor with the New York City Council. Uh, I will be moderating today's hearing. Before we begin, I just wanted to go over a few procedural matters. I will be calling on panelists to testify. I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until I call on you to testify, and you will then be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. At today's hearing, the first panel will be the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order that you've used it. I will now call on members of the administration to testify after reading the oath. Liz Vladek, Senior Labor Policy Advisor from the Mayor's Office of Policy and Planning, and Krishna Omalade, Vice President at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I will now read the oath. And then after, I will call each panelist from the administration to respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Liz Vladek? I do. Uh, Krishna Omalade? Yes, I do. Thank you. Liz Vladek, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Miller. Good morning, Speaker Johnson. And good morning, members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I am Liz Vladek, and I serve as the Senior Labor Policy Advisor to the First Deputy Mayor. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on Introduction 2252, sponsored by Speaker Johnson, which would require employers at certain city economic development projects and city human service contractors to enter into labor peace agreements. With me here today is Krishna Malade, Vice President of the Strategic Investment Group and Executive Director of NYCEDA and Build NYC within the Economic Development Corporation. I'd like to begin with a quick look back at this administration's record in advancing a progressive pro-labor agenda in New York City. This administration has worked closely with its municipal union partners um, to settle two rounds of contracts with New York City's workforce, reaching collective bargaining agreements which span between 11 and 13 years for most employees and revitalizing collaborative relationships with our union partners. Under this mayor, we've introduced new protections for our workforce, including paid parental leave and family leave and expanded paid leave during the COVID-19 pandemic, 
again in cooperation with organized labor and covering the vast majority of city workers. And we have been similarly determined when it comes to strengthening protections for workers in the private sector. From paid sick leave to fair scheduling for fast food workers and freelance worker protections. And as recently as last week, with the passage of retirement security reg legislation, uh, we have made great strides in raising workplace standards, especially for workers of color, for women, and for immigrant workers. These accomplishments in particular would not have been possible without the support of the city council, for which I thank each of you present here today. This administration has also made significant investments with the support of the council in the work of our nonprofit partners. As of fiscal year 2021, the city budget includes over $700 million in new investments in the nonprofit sector made during the administration. These investments provide resources to ensure that nonprofit human service organizations that New York City relies on can deliver high quality services to vulnerable New Yorkers. Further, just two weeks ago, uh, the mayor and the speaker announced a $120 million investment to cover indirect rates, which helps pay for rent and other key services. And in 2019, the administration worked closely with Henry Garrido and DC 37 um, to make a commitment to pay parity for our certified early childhood education teachers, which will take full effect by October of this year. This is a historic investment that fulfills the promise made by the mayor and the council to the provider community during summer 2019. Let me specifically address labor peace agreements. Um, I echo the comments of the chair and the speaker in the value of these agreements and the importance of ensuring workers have a right to organize. The mayor strongly believes in workers having this right and he's used the powers of his office to support this right wherever he can, wherever is appropriate. At his request, our Office of Labor Relations has frequently stepped in um, to uh, assist private sector employers and unions representing their workforces in resolving labor disputes. And he has actively used his bully pulpit to emphasize how critical it is that workers are free to organize. And as was mentioned, the mayor signed Executive Order 19 in 2016, which obligates certain developers of economic and housing development projects receiving financial assistance from the city to require large retail and food service establishments to enter into labor peace agreements with labor organizations that seek to represent their employees who work on the premises of such projects. So let me talk specifically about intro 2252. As was mentioned, this bill would require city human service contractors to enter into labor peace agreements with labor organizations that seek to represent their employers represent rendering services under city human services contracts. It would mandate that recipients of financial assistance from economic development projects require tenants, concessionaires, and contractors, including subcontractors, to sign labor peace agreements with labor organizations seeking to organize their workforces. The bill sets forth enforcement authority for the comptroller to audit contract compliance with the provisions and perform an investigation in response to a verified complaint. Let me say this clearly so no one misses it. The administration absolutely supports the intent of this bill. There are some areas we'd like to continue working with the council on as this bill moves forward. It is a very complex bill and we have not had a great deal of time to review it and consider all of its implications, but we do have some preliminary thoughts. Most important for today's purpose is to recognize the great range and diversity of services and work represented by the contracts that would be covered by this bill. For example, strictly with respect to human services providers, there are at least a dozen city agencies overseeing contracts with hundreds of providers, and each contract has its own characteristics that could be impacted differently by a bill like this one. 
we want to make sure we've established sufficient facts on the ground with respect to this universe where there will be so much variation to be confident that final legislation is sufficiently tailored to these facts, to the particularities of specific contracts to achieve the bill's stated objective and to eliminate or minimize unintended consequences. I want to point to um, one specific example, which is to emphasize that the city um, has uh, in particular supported the FRESH program tax incentive to ensure that full line supermarkets will take root in uh, communities that have lacked access to full supermarket ranges. And so for example, one of the things we wanna make sure we look closely at is any potential impact of this bill on a program like the FRESH program. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'd like to conclude by committing on behalf of the mayor to continue working with the council to ensure that the final draft of this bill will accomplish our shared goals of a more fair, equitable city that supports workers organizing and speaking collectively and effectively and efficiently delivers critical services to all New Yorkers. Thank you and we're happy to take your questions. Thank you, uh, we'll now turn to Chair Miller for any questions for the administration. Um, good morning again, thank you Liz. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure uh, working with you. It's, uh, uh, you've been a champion on the other side, and, 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 and quite frankly, uh, uh, your work and represent, uh, reputation on behalf of, of, of labor and, and work and family precedes you, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to work with you over the last few years. Um, so um, in, in terms of those concerns, do you, do you anticipate any concerns in the delivery of the uh, human services. Right. So this was what I was alluding to um, in terms of that phrase facts on the ground. We want to make sure we learn from the perspective of the employers and the workers providing these services what an impact of this bill could be. Let me give you some examples of the kinds of questions that mean a program is operating under very different circumstances. We'd like to ask questions such as, what are the particular services provided by a given contract? How central to the agency's core program is a contract? What percent of its program dollars does the contract represent? Um, Chair Miller, knowing how hard, is, hard it is to maintain an active union membership, um, we think one very important question is, for a particular contract, is there frequent provider turnover year to year, such that there's a new employer on a frequent basis? Or is there a longstanding stable relationship with a particular provider? Is the service the contract provides one for, one for which there are many providers to choose from? Or are we talking about something that's highly specialized um, where there's a much smaller universe of providers? And additionally, are there any state or federal mandates that um, an agency is obligated to comply with uh, that could intersect in any complicated ways with the requirements of this bill? Um, as I mentioned, and as I think it's sort of logical, um, when we're talking about hundreds of contracts that provide a very, very wide range of service to very different populations across the city, we wanna make sure we understand the answers to those and other questions um, in order to make sure we've got a bill uh, that will, will help them and that we've addressed any issues that could be a problem. Um, and I'm very glad to hear as, was, as I think the speaker and yourself mentioned that we will be hearing today from unions and providers um, and other organizations that can speak to the work under specific contracts and the services and workers that we're, we're really talking about. So you, you, you spoke to the diversity and, and the, the uh, vastness of, of the various contractors, um, that, that the universe of the contractors. Um, 
without speaking about the specifics, but just in general, how, how, how many how many contracts are out there? And more importantly, um, how many workers are potentially impacted uh, by this legislation? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, that's something that we've begun to look at. And so I don't want to give you an answer today that would be inaccurate. Um, we are fairly confident we are talking about hundreds of contracts, um, but we do want to dig down further to see how, how concrete and granular we can get in answering those questions. And we will certainly share back those answers as soon as we've assembled that data. Thank you. And, and Director, from, from, from an EDC perspective, um, uh, uh, the LPAs uh, that uh, have come through the agency thus far, uh, could you speak to that, the success of those, what you have learned and, and, and any concerns that you may have uh, moving forward uh, by the, with the expansion? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chair, Chairman Miller. Uh, so uh, to answer, I guess, the first part of the question, um, we uh, actually are still in the process of understanding the impact. Uh, we have um, a few projects that are subject to um, LPAs, but they involve long-term construction. Mm -hmm. Therefore, at this point, um, they're not yet at the point where the, um, the LPA is ready to potentially be enacted. So we're not you know, yet at the point of, of understanding the impact when it comes to uh, projects that are subject to the executive order. Um, in terms of the impact on projects, broadly speaking, I will echo um, Liz's comments that, you know, when it comes to city development projects, there's a wide range of projects, everything from the types of projects that the speaker mentioned um, during, during his statement, um, which I definitely um, echo his, you know, a lot of his statements in terms of wanting to support worker rights and um, and, you know, when it comes to larger projects, um, those are obviously very different from a lot of the smaller deals, which are oftentimes more common when it comes to city development projects, everything from, you know, a 15,000 square foot supermarket in central Harlem to, you know, an a HVAC, you know, manufacturing company in Massbeth, Queens, um, that are also city development projects. So I think we need more time and we look forward to engaging with, uh, with all of you on understanding the impact when it comes to various types of projects and wanting to make sure that we uh, you know, address uh, where companies are um, when it comes to uh, that, the scope of what this could impact. Mr. Chair, may, may I jump in for a moment? Yes, sir. Go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, so I just wanna be clear again, the labor peace agreements in no way force uh, unions to be part of any of these businesses or companies. It just says that uh, if we are contracting or giving city dollars uh, to these places that we're saying you can't interfere. You can't interfere with workers organizing. So uh, this just makes it so that you don't have union busting and tactics that have been used uh, time immemorial for folks that don't want workers to organize to engage in those tactics. So I'm a little uh, confused uh, by some of the statements this morning by the administration. I mean, I'm glad that you all are uh, in a sort of a macro way supportive of the aims of the legislation, but I, I, I kind of am scratching my head a little bit trying to understand wh what would the particular situation be, even if there was turnover amongst agencies or seasonality right. of some of these jobs how would that in any way uh, conflict with us saying we want people to not engage in tactics that interfere with union organizing? I'm not able to sort of circle that square in my in my mind. So if you all could just be a little more clear with me, because uh, I know you know you 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 are supportive of the aims of the bill. I'm not understanding where would there would be an instance where labor peace would in any way interfere with what you all are talking about? So Mr. Speaker, if I could give you an example, I think that's an excellent question and it's a good opportunity to, um, to, to start to get down into the weeds of, of how our operations work. Let's take the example of a relationship, a provider relationship, a service 
where there is actually frequent turnover of the provider, where it's not uncommon for a new provider to come in every one to two years. So the object of a labor peace agreement, as you say, is to help, is to protect the workers and also to ensure that the work can be done efficiently and effectively since union busting is often a way to make sure that can't happen. Well, if you have a new, for all intents and purposes, if you have a new employer once every year, once every two years, it's putting the union in a position where it has to come back and reorganize year after year. Um, and where it's starting over again in any contract negotiations or collective bargaining relationship. Um, and so it may be that where if we have contracts like that, we want to think about provisions specific to that scenario to ensure that while we're protecting workers' right to unionize, we're also maintaining the stability of the workforce, we're minimizing any confusion from provider turnover, et cetera. How many providers do you think we're talking about that make up that universe? So that's what we don't know. Um, and that's precisely what I, what I was saying. We wanna make sure we do understand that we do know um, and that we have engaged closely enough with our providers who are of course the ones doing this work day in and day out and need to tell us and will tell us um, what their contracts are, what they look like, what they're used for, how they work, how they function, we want to make sure we've understood that on an agency to agency basis um, because we think that for a range of reasons if we haven't developed that factual track record it's going to be harder to ensure the smoothest uh, maximally efficient implementation of this legislation and even if there is a seasonality or a high turnover, I'm still not understanding, forgive me, I'm not saying this in a, in a probing way, I'm, I'm just not understanding uh, how that, how that in, impacts or interferes with the nexus of that with labor peace agreements. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, so I'll just, I'll, I'll sort of broaden out to some of my old experiences on organizing and, and contract campaigns, where when you have turnover of employers or turnover of, of a workforce, you often have to go back to the beginning. You're sort of, you wind up in a cycle, in a loop of you've signed up a majority of workers, you're gonna start bargaining, but now the employer changes. And so you have to restart building that relationship, right? Fundamentally, labor peace helps parties start to establish a collaborative relationship, um, which, you know, in addition to the value it brings for workers, also maximizes the organization's ability to work effectively, right? When we value and recognize workers, we get better, you know, better whatever it is they're doing. Um, and so when you have to keep starting over again, look, look at the Amazon campaign down in Alabama, there's such high workforce turnover that the union could, had trouble maintaining at any given moment, representing a majority of the workers um, because they'd sign all these people up who would leave. And so they'd have to keep signing up and keep signing up, right? And, and again, this is just one specific example of a, of a factor that we wanna make sure we've taken into account. Mr. Speaker, but there, there is, there is, a precedent and a, a model for which uh, an industry addresses that, and, th and that is the, the school bus industry, where, where contracts transcend provider, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and I think that is a model that can be used, although, you know, uh, 1181 versus Bloomberg, uh, you know, that, that kind of fell apart, but the model itself is, is certainly the template for, for how this could be used. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for the testimony. We look forward to working together uh, to, to get this bill passed and to protect workers from uh, outside bad tactics. Uh, and we want more people to be protected. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity 
to provide a statement and ask some questions today. Yes, sir. Th- and th- thank you for your leadership on this. And, and we look forward to working with you and your team and the admin and making sure that, that we get through the concerns that are here so that we can uh, give uh, working folks the opportunity to do the things that matter most to, to this committee and this council, which is the right to organize and the right to collect the bargaining. Thank right? you. And, and, and those are the most important tenants that we can provide. Uh, for workers. Uh, we've been joined by council members Lewis and, and Dinowitz as well. Um, c- it, b- before I, I, I ask uh, uh, my colleagues uh, for, f- jumping for their questions, could we, um, d- Director, could we talk a little bit about, <clears throat> um, so you're saying that there are no current EDC projects that met the provisions or there was an attempt to organize since 2016? That's interesting. Uh, That's nearly five years. And and so is there a reason why, you know, we did something wrong here? uh, uh, That's not, it's a a good question. Um, It's not that there aren't projects that are subject to it. There definitely are. Um, it's that there are projects that, because they involve long-term construction uh, under the executive order, it obviously specifically applies to retail spaces within large development projects, and the spaces are not at the point of being. Oh, yeah. So that's what the situation is. But there are projects that, um, that based on uh, the, the size of the project. Um, but this is applicable to the actual construction as well? Uh, our reading of it is that it's not, it does not involve construction. Um, it's really just for employees, uh, permanent, um, you know, employees of businesses once the building is constructed. Okay. And of course, of course, construction is really the model for effective use of labor peace agreements, mm-hmm. right? We've had project labor agreement agreements in place with the building, um, uh, with the construction workers for over a decade. Um, And that's allowed us to maintain, you know, high standards for workers on city funded construction um, and ensure the work is done efficiently and well and that workers know they are unionized and have a representative. Uh, But uh, affordable housing construction is omitted from the program. Is that correct? That I, I, I would have to get back to you on that. I'm not an expert on that part of it. But they do receive, obviously, more than a million dollars in subsidy. I don't know. Okay. All right. That, yes, we, we'd like to hear that as well. Okay. Um, we're going to hear from my colleagues. Uh, does anybody have a hand raised here? Uh, just as a reminder to council members, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Some, sometimes it's not easy to put your hand on. I, I guess in this case, I see mine in front of me. In case someone doesn't, just give them a moment to jump in. Uh, seeing no hands, uh, Chair Miller, I'll turn it back to you unless you oh. give some more time. Okay, and then and then and then for those actively working on a development site, um, h- how would you interpret that? Does that mean construction? So my read of the draft legislation is that it covers um, it covers parties there in different capacities, but not construction, since construction is separately covered under our existing project labor agreements with the union. So actively working, who, who would that cover? Um, well, I can, tell you, I can tell you what we understand. Um, I can tell you what we, we understand to be in the bill. Um, I don't know that that definition leaves us completely clear on what exactly the universe is. Um, the bill refers to tenants, concessionaires, and contractors or subcontractors to sign labor peace agreements with labor organizations. Now, I think we're presuming 
that construction is not included under contractors, but that's an example of a place in the draft where I think we want to make sure we've got full clarity. Okay, because it says actively working on the development itself right. and, and or tenants. Right. Right. And, and so yeah. obviously that would be post construction and, you know, maintenance and detail and, and all of that other good stuff there. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, we, we appreciate that. And obviously we, we have a lot of uh, questions to be answered and I'm, I'm sure that that your office will be working uh, uh, diligently to get the answer so that we can expedite this. Um, and and, and um, in terms of EDC, um, what challenges, if any, have, have you seen uh, since 2016 on development uh, projects? Have you, because uh, their long-term construction, uh, as you said, that, that uh, we, we haven't gotten to the point of the organizing point yet. Uh, so, so uh, and assuming that we would not, uh, that then this does not apply to, to the construction phase or it just has not been challenged to that point. Would that be correct? That that there, there has been no one attempting to to organize uh, from from the construction perspective, uh, and 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 therefore uh, the intent uh, of the law has not been challenged. Well, so the law go ahead, the law the EO is pretty narrow because it it really is focused on I think retail workers. Um, so I, I defer. This, to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we're talking about the, the executive order 19. That's right. Or 2016. That's right. And so as far as we are aware, um, there has not been a union request for a labor peace agreement, um, at all. Certainly not one that ran into any difficulties. So there, there are, and, and there aren't any, and any projects that, that, uh, uh, that have been completed near incompletion uh, uh, with, with, the, with the retail tenant uh, that this would probably be applicable to um, that uh, would require uh, a, um, a, a, a organizing campaign. That's my understanding. And or the campaign did not it, it require uh, uh, the, any intervening with the administration because it just kind of went as as uh, the law intended. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, do, 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 do any of my colleagues have any questions? If not, uh, we will be forwarding questions. Uh, there are, uh, obviously this is a very complex issue. Um, I have many concerns about impact on uh, some of the things that we'll hear from uh, some of the service providers, what we'll hear from the unions. Uh, about their concerns and 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 obviously um, we'll uh, lean back lean down on on into all of those and and uh, reach out to you and your team and and uh, see if we can address these things here so uh, hearing none uh, Thomas we can dismiss the panel and 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 hear from the next panel thank you so much it's a pleasure to see you both and look forward to working with you in the near future Thank yeah. you, Miller. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We will now move to public testimony. As a reminder, all public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, please wait for a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first public panel in order of speaking will be Michelle Jackson from the Human Services Council, Henry Garrido from DC 37, Lawrence Ben from RWDSU, and Pete Dorton from Right to Recall. I will now call on Michelle Jackson. Time starts now. Hey, good morning. Um, I am MJ Okuma for the Human Services Council, um, filling in for Michelle Jackson. We're testifying today about intro 2252. Um, and due to the lack of time and outreach around this bill, HSC is not in a place to support or oppose this legislation, but we have a lot of concerns about how we arrive to this hearing today. The city plays an outsized role in setting the wages and benefits for government contracted human services workers. 
Simply put, the government is the main driver of wages in the sector. In any union negotiation around salary or benefits, along with other employment related matters, for many nonprofits would need to be made with the city at the table. Salaries or rates of services are often set by RFPs. And in the past, HSC has had our members proposals and city RFP, RFPs turned down because government agencies ruled that the salaries they wanted to pay made personnel costs too high. Because of this dynamic, bills like intro 2252 that impose penalties on city contracted providers without taking into account the role of city agencies for low wages and labor con conditions feel very incomplete. The bill is unclear what triggers providers need to submit documentations required by this legislation, and there are severe penalties for non-compliance, and it in no way acknowledges the outsized role that the city plays in funding these contracts and therefore their parts in the negotiations. It also doesn't address basic questions like how unionized human services providers will be treated in the RFP process, how will contracts be amended for union agreements, and what happens when union negotiation agreements terms run counter to the contracted agreement with the city? Who brings those folks to the table? The human services sector works with unions now. Many of our organizations are unionized or partly unionized, and many partner with unions on critical community issues. And we certainly all stand together in supporting the need for equitable living wages for the sector. However, without true partnership and understanding the terms of this legislation and the impact of the sector, we cannot offer a stance on this proposed legislation beyond being disappointed that it was introduced and brought to a hearing without real input from the sector or recognition that providers, that providers and, accountability for, and accountability from the city are both necessary parts of this equation. We hope that this bill doesn't continue to be rushed through council without working on addressing these important issues. Uh, thank you for allowing me to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. The next panelist will be Henry Garrido from DC 37. Time starts now. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I'm Henry Garrido. I'm the executive director of DC 37. I want to thank the speaker, Johnson, for his leadership uh, and for protecting working people as well as you as a chair, uh, Chairman Miller, for your work. Thank you. Um, I've often said uh, what happens when an unmovable force meets an unstoppable object. That space in between is usually, a, 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 in my opinion, a union. And what we're uh, asking in support of intro 2252 is essentially uh, a matter of fairness and equity. Um, a lot has been said about what the city has gone through in the, in the wake of uh, the pandemic and the recovery. The fact remains that the vast majority of those workers were deemed essential, who are in social services and other areas, uh, sacrificed their lives um, for the rest of New Yorkers, and they deserve some uh, respect, they deserve some equity, uh, and we believe one way to do it is to allow them to join union. Let me be very clear. We're not asking any employer to force any workers uh, to join a union. We simply lose looking for neutrality. We're looking for peace. And what that is, is what I mentioned at the beginning is that the most powerful force unions have to do uh, in many instances is to call for a strike of labor stoppages in order to uh, you know, get the workers and, and management, quite frankly, to um, listen to the workers' demands. We believe an interruption of many of these services would be a detriment to the city. Um, and we don't want to get to that point. So what we're simply asking for is peace, an opportunity for the workers to be the ones to decide whether they want to be in the union or not. Uh, and that's what this legislation was looking forward to. Um, I want to address some of the stuff that was raised before regarding turnover and what the concerns of the turnover. The vast majority of the contractors that we're talking about uh, are being rehired uh, by the city on a continuous basis. Where the turnover occurs is for the workers. And some of the turnover occurs because they don't have a union that negotiates good wages, good health insurance, good retirement security. And so they leave from the non-union work uh, uh, areas to a lot of the union workers. And you can see right now the difference between a social worker that is represented by a DC 37 or a UFT as compared to the one that is not represented 
wages are higher, the working conditions are better, they have a mechanism to address uh, a lot of the work-related concerns, safety issues, and whatnot. And I will conclude with this, Mr. Chairman. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm expired. You keep them up there, please. Go ahead. I, I just want to conclude. I will conclude with this. I would say to you that many of the labor, we've worked together with the Health and Human Services Council, with the their kit council. One perfect example of how we work together with the city council, the mayor's office, and I thank the mayor for his leadership on this and thank the speaker for it, is when we handle the pay equity issue with the daycare council, where for years, both the city and the providers were trying to figure out a way to fix the inequity which existed with teachers represented by the nonprofit sector of providing the same services for the kids were making 20 and $25,000 less than the teachers represented by a union. And it was that relationship between the council, between the mayor, between the employers, between the daycare council, the Hestas sponsor board that brought that issue to bear, where the majority of those represent unrepresented workers at the time were, you know, black and brown and people who are doing disenfranchised. And we see a parallel analogy here. But to do so, we have to be in the table uh, on the table, and the union uh, uh, needs to be part of it. And we believe Inter 2252 provides that neutrality that allows the workers to decide whether they want the union to represent them or not. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, for your opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Henry. Thank you for your testimony. The next panelist will be Lawrence Ben from RWDSU. Time starts now. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Kellerman. Um, I'll be speaking on behalf of Lawrence Ben. Um, I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Retail, Wholesale, and Department Store Union. Thank you for the opportunity to comment um, to the speaker and to uh, chair of the committee and to other committee members. Uh, really appreciate you moving this bill forward. Um, we do support the proposed bill. Um, RWDSU, along with a smaller core, a small cohort of other unions in New York, have advocated for labor peace for ages. As you well know, in 2016, we worked with Mayor de Blasio to, pa to pass Executive Order 19, which requires labor peace for subsidized retail projects in New York City. We've also established labor peace at the state level for the cannabis industry, where we represent the majority of it, workers in the industry, as well as the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which has a labor peace clause for airport contractors, where we represent thousands of concessions and catering workers. All this is to say is that there's substantial precedent for requiring labor peace um, where appropriate. Um, and given our history with labor peace, specifically focusing on Executive Order 19, um, I would like to speak about a particular concern we have with the current bill as proposed, which is the arbitrary threshold of $1 million in discretionary subsidies. Uh, similar to EO19, it, which also requires a $1 million threshold, um, as well as other arbitrary thresholds around uh, square footage of business, number of employees, et cetera, um, these thresholds have severely restricted the, the utility of this law. As an example, there are several projects subsidized by New York City where businesses receive just under, like literally just under the threshold of $1 million in subsidies and are not subject to labor peace, whereas several projects receive just over $1 million are subject to it. And there's no rational difference between those project sizes that would merit uh, such a threshold. And in fact, it actually encourages companies to finagle the subsidy process to arrive just under such thresholds to avoid the standard. Um, so let me speak to a bit of background. Um, the, the purpose of labor peace is to protect the city's investment in these projects, to be clear. That is the actual purpose of why labor peace is something that the city has the authority to mandate. And what this uh, the city's investment interest is called, quote unquote, a proprietary interest. And the city is protecting that interest from labor strife. So the idea is that the city, where it has invested in, in a project through discretionary subsidies, through a land lease, uh, where it's sort of where it's expecting a return on investment, the city wants to protect that investment from labor strife and therefore would require the contractors to uh, engage in labor peace. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's no arbitrary threshold that actually determines proprietary interest. And we, so we encourage the city to engage in more discussion on, on that issue 
um, in order to uh, arrive at the right standard. Um, I have a couple more comments if you'll just give me another minute. Is that okay, Chair? I, I will be quick. Yep, yep. go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I'll note that the removing the million dollar threshold may capture some smaller projects, but in practice, there's really, a, you establish a stronger proprietary interest argument through larger projects and unions will typically not try to organize smaller businesses anyways. So although a smaller business may be covered by the provisions of this bill, if we remove the million dollar threshold, there'll be no practical imp impact on these smaller businesses. Um, I'd like to speak to a couple comments um, that, that have been made so far. So the chair's question about why so few projects are covered by executive order 19. Um, so firstly, the arbitrary thresholds. Uh, our analysis is about five projects since 2015 have been covered by the, the standard. Um, but once a project actually gets subsidized, then it has to get permits, it has to actually build out, which can be a multi-year process, then it has to find tenants. So we're actually just now at the point at which projects are beginning to be completed that were subsidized back in 2016. And we are currently in, in conversations with some of those employers. Um, so for example, a new portion of Hudson Yards is covered by Executive Order 19, but they still haven't built out their ground floor retail or found tenants. So therefore there's actually nothing to do yet under the executive order um, because there's no tenant to actually enter into a labor peace agreement with. And in fact, uh, Hudson Yards, again, because of these arbitrary thresholds may try to build out under 15,000 square foot tenants in order to avoid coverage under the law. So again, these thresholds are problematic. Um, as to housing and construction, um, again, the EO only covered retail employers. So a developer may build housing with retail on the ground floor, but the housing portion is not subject to labor peace, only the retail employer that comes in. So that's why it's so narrow in scope. It, it's similar to the construction uh, that's not covered by this. Um, and, and then as relation to the city's comments, uh, the FRESH program in particular is actually covered by the executive order 19. So um, it, this proposed bill would uh, create no new standards for uh, fresh food grocers that are taking uh, subsidies through the fresh program because they're already covered by a labor peace requirement. Um, and as to the on the ground specifics of contracts, like seasonality, it's, it, that is an largely an irrelevant question for establishing whether the city has proprietary interest in a project for determining whether they can establish labor peace. So I'd love to talk to y'all more about this. We have a lot of background on this and uh, we really appreciate you bringing this forward. We've been advocating for this issue for a long time and thank you to the chair for giving me some extra time. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The last panelist will be Pete Dorton from Right to Recall. Time starts now. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Council. So I uh, was uh, fortunate enough to testify back in January about I'm one of the 850 terminated employees of the Merritt Marquis in Times Square, which is a non-union hotel. And um, after listening to everyone th this afternoon, hearing that we we non-union people need protection and I think some people forget how difficult it it is to organize and and try to get a union into a corporation that is fighting you and you know I worked there for 16 years trying to get um, protections and now that the the pandemic hit we were all terminated and we have no protection so we we organized ourselves and we got right to recall legislation and we finally got it introduced to city council. And um, thanks to Brad Lander and it's co-sponsored by uh, council member Adams, uh, council member Iaea and uh, uh, Re uh, council member Reynosa. Um, we unfortunately, you know, we need to get this passed right away because the city is opening up. The mayor is gonna be opening up the city and we need our jobs back. You know, okay, we need um, our with, with, with all due respect, could you speak to 2252? This hearing is about 2252. Right. So, so with that, I, I would just uh, want to say that, you know, you're, um, a lot of non-union workers need that union protection, but, but it's, it's difficult for us to organize when these companies aren't letting us organize. 
and and we we need help with the organization to get a union behind us and you know and and i'm i'm an example of how having a, no union protection look where where we are now you know we are jobless and and we have we have no voice and we're just trying to get our voices heard and i know that that goes for all the industries in new york city that are non-union we we need the union to protect us um, it's just, you know, how do we get that protection if, you know, we, we were thrown out? And I'm, and I'm sorry if, I, if I'm speaking off topic. I'm just, you know, we're desperate. We're, we're, we're desperate workers trying to, to survive this pandemic. And we are New Yorkers and, and we need city council to help us. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes the public panel. I will now turn it over to Chair Miller for any questions for the panelists. Thank you, Thomas. So, um, I, th th there was a question. Uh, th th I did have some concerns about uh, the, the the retail uh, subsidies uh, involved here. Uh, say, for instance, uh, Hudson, Hudson Yard is 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 the retail portion uh, subject to uh, subsidies. Do they have subsidies available to the retail portion of the development, or is it just, or is it the land? Is it whatever that goes in? Because you know we were we you know often in in uh, uh, in affordable housing, you know the, it is the units that are actually subsidized. And, and, and therefore uh, a community space, retail space, not applicable in, in certain areas. Uh, what makes this different? Or could you explain that? Yeah, I, I can speak to that chair if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. The certain, we imagine some finagling has happened in that way where, you know, they set up a separate LC for the upper floor construction. Um, similar to how some housing is done, um, but it's a little bit hard to track all of that. That for Hudson Yards in particular, um, so this is this is the newer portion of Hudson Yards that was approved and subsidized since 2016 and therefore subject to the EO. Um, th the entire project was subsidized as sort of one lump, is, mm -hmm. that's how I understand it. And therefore, any re ground floor tenant that's retail that also is meets the other thresholds, which are, it has to be over 15,000 square foot tenant, and have more than 10 employees um, would be required to enter into a labor peace agreement. Um, and so do you have any examples of, of, of folks who kind of uh, through some actions have, have tried to usurp in the, 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 the law, local law 19, uh, that, that subsequently uh, there were some compliance grievances or some oversight grievances that that and concerns uh, that RSDW has had that that you know of. It, again, it, it's l still too soon, um, as um, uh, Krishna from the EDC noted. Um, no project that is covered by the EO actually has employees in the retail portion yet. In, in other words. We there's no one to enter into a labor peace agreement yet with a union in any of these projects. And it's just simply because of the okay. build out time. Okay. We are close though. I mean, hopefully we will have an answer for that. I, and hopefully, next yes, and hopefully few months, yeah, but, yeah, this is just hyperbole and it doesn't happen in, in that, you know, things work as they were intended to work and 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 if not, and then we don't have to revisit it. Yeah. Um yeah. uh uh executive director Garrido, um Good morning again, sir. Is, is there a, uh, you know, we, we did talk about, <laughs> uh, we, we spoke specifically uh, about the school bus industry and, and some of the precedents that have occurred there uh, where contracts uh, 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 rolled into or rolled into RFPs until challenged uh, by, by, by the Bloomberg administration. And, and we saw uh, quite frankly, a, a middle class industry uh, with with experienced uh, workers, particularly bus drivers and matrons, um, see their quality of life greatly diminished. 
be, be, because of that. Um, and and so that's a two parter. Uh, do do you foresee something like that occurring? And in the case that uh, uh, wages and benefits are rolled into RFPs, which had been nego previously negotiated, um, that uh, there needs to be additional provisions to ensure that that happens in in, in perpetuity, you know, regardless of who gets the contract and or who 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 the mayor is. Right. I, so I, I see a bit of a parallel. I think there are fundamental differences in, in, the, in the, the, the proposal for the bus contract. And I think the biggest issue is the federal preemption law and whether in fact this bill, you know, would do that. I think this bill doesn't do that. This bill provides simply a labor neutrality and a peace agreement, which allow the workers to uh, choose a union. Um, and to the second point, Look, let's be honest with you, even with, and you mentioned the Bloomberg administration, for years, this industry has been defunded uh, and has not been properly provided for. And I think that when you heard the testimony from the Health and Human Services Council, the city does have a responsibility in setting wages. The difference though, is that under the city charter, when there are wages that are on the collective bargaining agreement in the charter, then when the city contracts, it has an obligation to fulfill that responsibility. And I submit to you that the reason why so many of these workers, thousands of them, have been underpaid and undervalued and um, do not have a job security, do not have uh, retirement security, do not have proper health insurance, is because they don't have a union. And so the industry, I mean, the, the, the sector, I should say, has been trying to advocate for all these things that include increasing living wage or prevailing wage or, or retirement security for all uh, separate from the legislation. Those are peace, in our opinion, piecemeal approach to the bigger question, which is, do you have an entity that not only advocates for these workers on a permanent basis, uh, not just for the providers, but for the workers themselves, right? Do we have a mechanism to uh, adjudicate dispute within the workplace? Do we have a mechanism to address long-term turnover and sustainability of the sector? And so if the city wants to be responsible by providing all these services to the hundreds of thousands of people that are affected, both the workers and the people are affected, why not have a mechanism to do that? And so what we've been able to do in the public sector, which we do now, we represent a lot of social services and a lot of other unions uh, titles that would be covered under the public sector is we've been able to do that. And whether there are difficult issues for health insurance, whether it's pension salaries, we do it in the context that, you know, uh, the city's economic um, uh, uh, reality doesn't outweigh the, the current uh, and existing uh, situation. And I think that for social service workers, for workers that are covered under the contracts of the city of New York, that would be a profoundly different tool that the city could, a transformative tool, I should say, that the city could use to both not only raise wages and eliminate the kind of turnover that we're seeing, but also to create a fair process where those workers can adjudicate their problems and where we have a sustainable workforce that can serve the public and sometimes the most vulnerable population consistently. You, you know what, I, I, I agree and, 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 and that kind of, brings to light the, the conversation that we've been having probably for the last seven and a half years about the work that we have done in the council on behalf, with the best of intentions, on behalf of, of working families, working people here in New York City. Um, I would submit that the work that we've done has been great, but oftentimes it's been a flaw. Not only has it set at a floor and, and not the ceiling, it has probably prohibited uh, workers from achieving uh, ultimately the fair compensation, uh, because when we start talking about living wages, uh, living, what, what, what is that, you know, uh, is, is it industry standard? Um, who decides what that living wage is? Uh, are there benefits uh, and fringes that go along with it that create the kind of quality of life that, that uh, mitigates the need for the type of attrition that we see in these industries, as you said, that first opportunity that that early childcare developers that that require 
uh, that do the same work, that require the, to require the same uh, academic certifications and get paid $25,000, $30,000 left, first chance they get to leave, uh, and the same would, would apply to in the human service industry and, and come over to, to a city-ran agency, uh, which is unionized, which has uh, these benefit packages, then, then they're going to leave, right? So the quality of deliverable of services really depends on not just even me and my expertise and 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 and, and contract negotiations and and, and experience uh, in in that area. You know, I don't have the ability and resources to negotiate for these workers. Therefore, um, anything that we do in terms of passing laws. Um, really omits the most important, the, 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 the second most important component to, to lifting up workers after the right to organize is the right to collect the bargain, right? And, and if that's not there, you know, the standard is not what the standard can be. Right, I mean, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I think that the analogy that was earlier placed by the administration regarding what happened to Amazon workers in Alabama is a it's a pretty good, you know, analogy for this. First of all, we're not there. We're not in Alabama. The city council of New York City has set the standards about how workers should be treated. And I think I applaud you for it. And we're not denying the progress that has been made over the last seven years under the administration, seven and a half years, uh, in terms of how we treat workers. But we need a permanent structure for that. We, we cannot just be on the basis of, well, we negotiate a, a budget so maybe we do some indirect care here, we do indirect care there. And one thing that we are, has not been said is the union is giving up one thing, very critical component to what has been a tool to unions, which is the right to strike. Because if we were to strike in those industries to demand what would be fair, which is equal pay, not better pay, just equal pay, equal pay, equal protection under the law, you know, especially in what we've been through, you know, in this, this moment of the pandemic, you know, health and safety measures. Um, Absolutely. Regular standards for people to be, you know, protected in the workplace. If we were to strike, if we were to do a work stoppage, who would be affected, right? Senior citizens, people who need to work, right? The most vulnerable population would be affected for that. So we want to be a responsible union in saying, we don't want to have any kind of work disruption. There is another way. And in exchange, what we're asking for in giving that process, that tool, is simply we just want a peaceful process. I want to emphasize the word peace. A peaceful process by which the workers can elect to have a union or not. It doesn't force them. It doesn't obligate an employer. It gives the workers a choice without having to go through that, that the, the war that sends up with both employer and employ and, and unions set on the one side and begin to have a fight. So that's what we're asking for. And we think under the circumstances is only fair. Thank you, Mr. Director. Uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, good morning. How are you? Uh, Helen Rosenthal has a question. Jump great, right. thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. This has been a uh, great hearing. I really appreciate your moving this um, idea along. Um, I do have a question for um, Executive Director Garrido, um, but I want to sort of explain my thinking first. Um, you know, I'm a huge proponent of paying these essential workers as much as humanly possible. Um, I think they should be paid in the same um, payment range as construction, as union construction workers. Um, the work they do to um, foster healthy communities is critical to our city. I think that um, the city has for years taken advantage of the fact that the human services sector is a mission driven sector that has the capacity to raise money from private donors. And for that reason, all three levels of government, the federal, the state, and the city government 
um, don't pay for 100% of the work. If the city were doing the work itself, if the city had its own city employees for senior centers, for example, they would be probably union, <laughs> DC 37 union, um, and, and, and that would all be great and appropriate, but they're not. There are these mission-driven agencies that grew out of religious institutions that provided care for the poor for no money or very little money. That's, that's just the history of it. And I am, you know, a thousand percent in support of these workers unionizing I'm in a thousand percent support of them being paid what they should be paid. I think what I don't understand is who's going to pay once the contracts, once we've gone through a negotiation. And, you know, Henry, you might say, oh, Helen, you're getting a step ahead of yourself. Let's just first say, let's give them the right to organize. I, of course. Of course, but I really, unless we add a provision to this bill saying that all levels of government or city government has to make up the difference in pay so the burden doesn't fall on the social service provider. I just, from a practical standpoint, I don't understand how it works. Like yeah. another way to do this is just make these all city services. Turn these, you know, make them government run services and then, you know, we'll be accountable. But right now we're not. And I just, this is an issue that I'm sorry to keep yammering on, but this is an issue that I've thought about for all eight years and have tried to come up with legislation that would require, um, you know, market rate payment, you know, a fair and just payment for these workers. Um, I just don't know how to effectuate it. Can you help me with that? If I may, I think, I think, let me address this in two parts. First of all, much has been done about the discussion about wages. And yes, we, we do have generally folks that get paid substantially more on the union contracts than on the non-union contracts. So obviously there's an inequity there that we'd like to fix. And we would do so by having, you know, the kind of collective bargaining agreements and the right to collectively bargain to key issue. We don't want to see that to be a result of a non-funded liability for the providers. Exactly. We definitely have to advocate that the payment and the proper funding of those uh, positions and the subsequent that comes with what we expect to be an increase as a result of unionizing, that is a fair wage, uh, a, a living wage and a fair wage that the city would have a responsibility to fund it as, as, you know, as part of the discussion. But I will submit to you that wages are not, uh, you know, salaries are not the only issue. Yes, we want workers to get paid better. Yes, we want them to have access to health insurance. And, and yes, we want them to have action to Time. the country. But I will say to you, sure. I, I'm just answering the question that there's, a, there's another issue here, which is, do the workers have a voice in the workplace? And I use health and safety Please. as an example of it. Right now, as we get back to work, as the mayor has ordered the agencies to go back to work, unions are working with several agencies doing pre-occupancy inspections, making sure that H, B, and C is fixed, making sure that there's air quality, making sure that we negotiate with agencies, staggered shift to make sure that we observe social distancing, right? We have say, safety and health rules to make the workers and the employers feel more at ease about a transition with a huge pandemic. We don't have that with the non-union workers. We Correct. do not have that. That's with right. The non-represented workers right now. That's right. But for them, many of them who are coming to us and saying, we want to join the union. And as you said, we didn't join this industry because of the wages, because we, we did it because we believed in a cause. We believed in a cause but we don't have ourselves mechanisms. You, you have organizations that are fighting for a living wage and for people to get out of poverty. 
that are paying the same poverty wages that they're advocating against yeah. for the public. Living, their workers are living in shelters and they, the workers are working at another shelter. Correct. And, and, I, and I, I think that, that we want to be able to address that situation. And I personally believe, obviously I'm biased, I'm a union uh, person through and through and have been. But I think the, the, the evidence is there that when you have a unionized sector, as the chairman mentioned, the boss services, you have a mechanism to address these disputes in a way that doesn't overburden the taxpayers, but in a way that doesn't overburden your providers who are going to leave. So I think there's a mechanism for this and labor pieces want to do so. So um, the way to implement a lot of these very complicated issues with retention and turnover is by having a mechanism to do that. And one way to do that is by having a collective bargaining agreement. By having a collective bargaining agreement, you need a union to do that. To have a union, you need the workers to decide. And they don't have to be uh, uh, punished, discouraged, and also for exercising the right to do that. And that's what we're looking in this legislation is to make it easier. Everybody agrees to a peace agreement and a neutrality agreement and let the workers decide. If the workers decide that being in a union is not the way to do it, then so be it. But you we know, are looking for a mechanism to do so. Everyone, I mean, everyone would want to be, I'm a pure union person because that's how, you know, we lift all boats. And so I'm 100% committed to the union. That's not my question. My question is sort of, who is obligated to pay for it right now is it's not like in the maybe we should take this offline i don't mean to belabor the point but it's just get it the labor but it's just that these mission driven organiz um nonprofits I mean, unless we're saying we want you to open up your books and show us that some of your private sector money, philanthropy money, sorry, some of your philanthropy money could pay for higher wages and you're holding back on that philanthropy money and instead working the workers too hard and you're off setting up a new program and you're underpaying your workers. I, 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 I can see that. Um, but I just think that, like, can I give another example like you gave with the pandemic? At the beginning, the homeless service outreach workers met with me, they're not unionized. And they said, you know, we're being asked to go out on the street and we have zero protections. Remember at the beginning, like you were fighting for your workers. How do we get PPP? How do we, our hours are out of control. People don't wanna to come to work. So other people have to do multiple shifts. Our, they could have benefited from a union. And so, you know, one of the things that I pushed very hard for was making the argument to the city that eventually hazard pay would be covered by FEMA and we must give these people hazard pay because we're asking them to do too much. And I don't think, I mean, we talked about it. I don't know actually what eventually happened, but I do know that the nonprofits around me basically raised private money, philanthropy that paid for an additional, I forget, $2 an hour. And they were, the workers were a little bummed because another nonprofit used philanthropy yep. to raise enough money for $3 an hour. Exactly. That's exactly the point about the right. system. They I, broke my heart. I agree. When in the middle of this pandemic, we were distributing PPE to our workers. And some of these workers were working plastic bags to protect themselves. Absolutely. And to the extent that we had any leftover, we gave them, the union gave them to the non-union workers, but that shouldn't be. We shouldn't be in a city this rich to do this. 
I but in short answer to your question, Councilwoman, yeah, please. the current city charter requires that if the city is entering into a contract with a provider and there is a collective bargaining agreement that unless specified otherwise, that collective bargaining agreement raised has to be paid by the city. That's in the charter right now. So what we are hoping and expecting is that that would be the situation. And, 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 and that the RFP would reflect that. Yes. Right. right. So, so they know what the cost is going in, right? And that we can no longer, uh, you know, yeah. undervalue. And Helen, I think I think that you brought up a very, very valuable point because we're getting caught up in the, the dollars and the cents and what we've learned over the last year more than anything. Uh, the greatest value to 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 organized labor and, and, and to union was 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 safety and 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 quite frankly, worker protection. We see it day in and we see it day out uh, that, that that there's a a, a clear difference. And, and a workforce that is that is represented by organized labor and those that aren't and, and it's unfortunate uh, those essential workers during doing doing the same work during uh, not just uh, on a regular basis but it was heightened during the pandemic uh, as to how they were being what the workforce was being managed right and if you don't have someone to advocate on your behalf to set standards on your behalf, then you know th that's a problem, and we cannot get caught up in that because there are so many folks now in the midst of this pandemic, and organized and not organized, that you know we've retreated to the canary in the coal mine under this pandemic. Yeah. How much can workers take? How much can workers endure? How much can we get away with before you know it interferes with that we can't hire anyone else because we have to hire a you know a, a three a one for three situation and all right. the things that we see, even in municipal government where, where people are, are, are organized and that, that workers are no longer just working double shifts, but they're working triple shifts that we have to get back to the nexus of what organized labor is, right? And, and that is the health and safety of the workers. And, and, and we're, we're getting th this conversation is going beyond that, right? And, 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 and when you talk to the, to the director, um, and, and you talk to RSTW that, that, you know, wages are important, but right now we're just talking about saving lives, right? And, and how do we keep people safe? And, and there's a distinct difference in a union shop and a non-union shop when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we've just seen it over the past year and, and we want to return better than we left. I'm and with you. That opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Chair Miller, and I'll wrap up. I appreciate your time and your indulgence. I, I guess I would just ask that as part of this conversation that there is a task force or a working group to sort of um, get through the tangled web of financing for these mission-driven nonprofits. I, I, I don't think the goal, and, and nor the goal, nor should it be the burden of the organization to figure out how to pay these wages, right? And 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 that, you know, when, when it's bargained and it's in the RFP, that that's kind of taken care of, right? Got it. And, and and the contract will take care of that. And I and I know before we wrap up, we 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 had uh, we had the uh, service uh, uh, providers that wanted to jump in as well as RSDWU, but we can start with uh, service providers. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Chair Miller. I appreciate it, and, and thank you, Rosenthal, for uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, for bringing that up because I think that's definitely one thing that that we're concerned about with this bill. Um, one component from the Human Services Council's perspectives is that unions have historically not raised the wages for human services providers at our member organizations. HSC has members who are unionized and the limitations have always been city contracts. Um, and if to the extent that that provision is there, we've never seen it executed effectively up until this point. Um, I think one other concern just about the price tag of this bill that we have is that the bill imposes an unfunded mandate to the extent that all employees really should work with a labor, count, a labor council to talk about and, and negotiate these labor piece of agreements. And we're worried that there's just simply not enough pro bono lawyers for us to, for every single human services provider who has a contract to make sure that those costs would be covered 
and that it could be done effectively. So there's just a lot of questions about the, the cost of this um, that we would love to be brought to the table, uh, meet with you, meet with the speaker who's the prime sponsor of this bill and really hash out like what this would look like in practice. I think um, based on the opening remarks um, from this hearing, if the intent here is to raise the wages for this essential human, for the essential human services workforce, which is something we, we are fully behind in, in, in Councilmember Rosenthal, we've been working with you on for, for, for years, but if that's the intent of the bill, the city can just do that. These are city contract employees whose salaries are, are set, you know, by, by city agencies through the RFP process and and um and through the contracting system that like that can be done and that can be done um by the city like right now if if that was if that was the goal. Well, well kind of if you left it up to the city you <laughs> end up with a living wage right which is not a living wage and, and the provisions that really lift uh workers I, I think again that doesn't happen here in the council and it doesn't happen at city hall um, there are experts that really do that, 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 that create industry standards, that, that do really do the in-depth work, that, that come up with these compensation packages, and, and, and that is organized labor, and, and, and I kind of, I think that's, that's the nexus of where we're trying to get to, but we, I think we're all in agreement that we should not ask providers to bear the, the burden. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, RSDW. Could you unmute? Uh, yes, okay, here I am. Hi, everybody. Uh, sorry, Josh Kellerman with RWDSU. Hello, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank Great you for your comments. Great to see you, and I've Great appreciated to see you working with you, trying to unionize a nonprofit that was in a similar bind. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to mention something about that. So we recently won a, con won a vote uh, to represent the workers at Housing Works who do some city contracting. And the, the thing about finance, and I say this somewhat tongue in cheek, but there's a reality here that they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on a white shoe law firm to bust yeah. the union. Yeah. That's where some money could come from to raise wages for workers. If, <laughs> yeah, if they were required to Trust be me. neutral, then they I would have just We know all they about were, that. that, that you know, is, so yeah. this is partly where it comes from. And I'll just, you know, this, the big picture is that what we're simply trying to do is to right the wrongs of federal labor law, that federal labor law makes it nearly impossible to organize. And the city has the ability in some specific ways to right, to, to balance the, the tables here, to balance the scales in organizing uh, so that employers are neutral and can't utilize all the loopholes in federal labor law to bust a union. Um, and, and the, you know, and so where, of course, we need to think about the financing. Of course, we need to think about some other details here. But um, big picture, this really is just about workers having a voice. Um, and, uh, and so we thank you for moving this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do, do any of my colleagues have questions? Any further? Helen? Well, I do, but I'm trying to be polite. <laughs> Helen, <laughs> jump in because, um, I, you know, we, we want to make sure that we have as much information as possible. Uh, that's what we, when, when we, uh, our opening statement said that we want to explore pros and cons and unintended consequences. And Thank so you, Chair Miller. feel free to do so. Um, Thank you. Uh, this is going to be kind of uh, some, the background of, 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 of the information that goes to administration that, that goes to uh, the, the service providers as well as the unions and, and see if we can get to the core of how we get this done, right? And, and if there needs to be any such amendments, and if not, we need to just move forward. So, but we need to talk it through. With that, we also need to be in the transportation hearing that is happening simultaneously, okay? All right, I so. promise one quick minute, one last question um, for Director Rito. To MJ's point that he just brought up, that it's in the contract, if what you're saying, you understand this so much, you understand this. So if it's in the charter now, then why, why can't we force the city to do it now? And that's, a, that's actually a very good point. The reason is because only 80% of the sector is unionized. So you don't have enough unionized workers in the sector to raise the wages pursuant to the contract. And you have sort of contract, the contract providers competing with non-union contractors and trying to compete and doing a bid and a budget 
we compress wages. So we, we sort of like, it's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? That you set the wages by the city when negotiations after you select through a procurement process, but because the vast majority of workers are not in the union, you're not raising the sector as it is. And I make the, I make the example of the, and, and the example that contrary to what was said, when DC 37 took over negotiations for yes. child care, yes. pay equity. We've been talking about this for 20 years. Yes. And how we were able to do that? Complicated negotiations that include the labor reserve. We've managed to come into the city and say, here's some things that we can do. And we managed to get it done. And we raised the wages immediately, you know, upon taking over the, 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 the organization that was a nonprofit affecting thousands of teachers and non-teaching alike. So I think that, the, so in our defense, we, we have a short but true record in our union having delivered that. What, what has transpired is because the majority of the, of the sector is not in a union, it's hard to effectuate changes to the non-union workers when you have no right to represent them. And to say that if you have 18 to 20% of the unionized workforce getting paid more than the non-union within the same scope of contracts, that is incredible. That's an inequity in, 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 that exists right now. But and we, we like, deal with this all the time. It sounds like it's illegal. I mean, shouldn't then the AG be going after the city to force them to pay all titles the same? I mean, because the no. deal that you made happen, which you know everyone is grateful for, for sure. Um, and it did involve the city making up the difference, not the nonprofit. But still there were so special needs, um, daycare providers, and others that, you know, unfortunately were left out because, uh, you know, I don't know how you do all you do in the first place. Um, and, and part of that is because of what I mentioned about the labor reserve, which is a key component of what we were able to do. The labor reserve not only covers the unionized workers, it doesn't come the non-union employees. And I don't have legally the ability to use any kind of leverage from existing unionized representative workers to create any kind of fund to help out how you move funding for the city. And so the answer to your question, it is not illegal because all the charter says is that you have to pay the wages that is consistent with the collective bargaining agreement. If you have a collective bargaining agreement, they're paying those wages. But if you don't have one, they don't have to pay it. And that's no. precisely our point that if you had a union, then you would be covered by a collective bargaining agreement. And by nature, you would have to pay the higher the wages. So it just, it's cost and effect, right? It's this, and, and to, to us, I think it is, but I want to emphasize wages is not the only reason why For we're sure. doing this. Yep. Because yep. leaving wage in the past, uh, uh, prevailing wage has not led to the kind of worker empowerment that have led to the transformative needs. And quite frankly, has led to more unfunded liabilities for the providers. Right. Because this is for them as well. What we're asking for is a partnership with the city for neutrality, let the workers decide. And then we commit to ensure to continue to lobby, not only on behalf of the workers, but on behalf of the providers as well, who would be benefited by unionized sectors as we've seen in other sectors like the childcare sector. Henry, I'm grateful for your work. And I I'm, thank you, Chair Miller, for giving me a little thank more you. time. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have anyone else in uh, any of the other members that have questions? Chair, Councilmember Adams has her hand raised. There you go. Councilmember Adams? Talks now. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Chair Miller. You know, uh, this has been such a compelling hearing for me uh, this morning. And I know that, that we got to get out of transportation, but I, I just had to make a statement. Um, you know, there are just so many, you know, levels again that we've reached um, in another, what I can oversight hearing. Um, <laughs> Executive Director Garrido, you are golden um, for New York City um, and for, um, for workers, you know, everywhere. Um, it, it, it's the, the testimony that we've heard this morning, everything from the gentleman that said, you know, how do we unionize? How do we do this? How do we get help to do this? 
You know, I've heard that also in my district um, where we've had, you know, several incidents of people being hurt that were not a part of a union. What do we do about that? I think this legislation covers all of that, but the mere fact that we're here um, asking these questions and hearing the testimony and hearing the answers, the results, and the magnitude of what this legislation is going to do for non-unionized workers across the city is immensely powerful. You know, um, for my colleague, uh, Councilmember Rosenthal, you again were reading my mind and that's why you're one of my mentors in the council. How do we do this? How do we pay for it? Who's gonna do this? Who's gonna handle? And I think, um, Henry, you were just spot on, you know, with your response and, uh, you know, and the reason why we're doing it and the reason why this legislation is so needed across the board. So I just wanted to make sure that I got my remarks on the record. I think that this hearing has been remarkable and, uh, and this legislation is sorely needed. So uh, thank everybody that testified this morning um, for you know, enlightening all of us on this important issue, even though for the, <laughs> I was gonna say for the most part, I can't speak for all of my colleagues, but I, I, I know for the members of this committee and I see my chair smiling, we are totally dedicated to this cause uh, and, and, to, and to creating equity for our workers in the city of New York. So I thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Chair Miller, for giving me a moment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council, Council Member Adams, and, th and thank you for being a part of the work and, and, and everyone on the committee for being a part of this work, it's just committing, because uh, we do a lot of work outside of the hearings. Um, and and uh, I, I'm so grateful to, to have each and every one of you as part of the committee because you want to be a part of this committee, that you want to serve working families here in the city of New York, and you want to be thoughtful and figure out how we uh, lift workers and how we compensate and we value and appreciate work is essential. Uh, how we define, particularly those communities of, of, of color and, and immigrant communities that have been underrepresented, how we bring them into the fold. You and I represent a, a, a Southeast Queens community that has the, the highest dense union density nearly in the nation. And, and, and it's not an accident uh, that we also have the highest African-American home ownership and upward mobility, right? That they're not mutually exclusive. That That is the way that it happens. And that is what we want to be able to share with all workers. And and, and so we, we work hard to, to, to do that. And so I, I thank you uh, for being a partner. I thank the, the members of the committee for supporting the work that we do here. Uh, to all the folks that are testifying today, we look forward to working with you in the future and passing this legislation to getting to a point that we know um, that it, it can be done. We know it can be done, but more importantly, how it will be done. Is, is, is more important. And so we look forward to that. And if there are no other questions, no other hands, uh, I, I thank everyone uh, for joining us here this morning. Uh, the work continues, struggle continues. Look forward to working each, with each and every one of you. And with that, uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you.